Good afternoon. It's, it's always a pleasure. So uh, the title of today's talk is up on the screen, Behavioral Management in Dementia, a.k.a. Public Enemy Number One, if, if you're a geriatric psychiatrist as I am, and a.k.a. Proteins Gone Bad, we're pretty sure that's what Alzheimer's dementia is, at least on one level. But with no further ado, we'll launch. So. Uh, I hope we're not being overly ambitious, but uh, I always have a, a game plan, so a number of parts because I'm a real simple guy and I have to sequence things. So uh, the game plan today is uh, we always have to define our terminology. The Jesuits insisted on that. And, and epidemiology is just a, a fancy term for how common and, and where would we find um, our topic today. And then, uh, since I'm an ex-military guy, I'm obsessed with acronyms. So we've got an acronym here to help clinicians. The acronym is It's Over, and I'll define that. And then we're going to talk about non-pharmacologic strategies to control agitation in dementia. Um, and, and there's a number of strategies and a number of therapies. And then we'll shift over to, to pharmacotherapy. And I'll just say that this is in transition. It's always in transition. We're always trying to build better mouse traps. And then uh, last few pieces, some closing thoughts. The AAGP is the American Academy on Geriatric Psychiatry. So we actually have a little august body that, that guides us. And then uh, if time permits, we'll, we'll talk about maybe some new treatments on the horizon. And of course, we're talking about uh, agitation and behavioral problems and folks that, that, are, that suffer, that are cursed with dementia. And I'm, I'm always reminded of this salient quotation by Bill Clinton, the worst wounds are those that are self-inflicted. And the, perhaps that's philosophical, but maybe they're the most painful. And of course, folks with dementia are inflicting wounds upon themselves unknowingly, unwittingly, if you will, which may make it more painful not only for them but for their caregiver. But first and foremost, uh, definition. So agitation can cover a very broad spectrum. I, uh, I find that one of my, my daily challenges is families or spouses will call me and they'll say, my, my husband or my father is not doing well. Um, and that, that's fairly nonspecific. So I'm always asking for details and specifics. And, uh, and, and because that guides us in terms of diagnosis and treatment and management. But agitation, I think, might be the, one of the most common terms used in uh, particularly facilities. And, and as you can see, it, it sort of covers a, a broad spectrum, doesn't it? It covers verbal, motor, or vocal activity. And, and there's that, that important adjective, inappropriate verbal, motor, or vocal activity that, that's not need-based, okay? I think we all understand when things are need-based, that's not agitation. That might be urgency, okay? And, of course, in psychiatry, as, as you've come to know that lovely subspecialty, we love to take things that are simple and make them very wordy and complex because we just like to do that. So we will call agitation BPSD, so behavioral and psychiatric symptoms of dementia. And that does cover an enormous spectrum of difficult behaviors that we will see in the, the demented population. So let's, let's uh, section it down. Let's parse it down. Inappropriate behavior. So we'll go with physically aggressive behavior. So these are, are really terrible things for patient and targets. Hitting, kicking, biting. Okay, I mean, can you imagine taking care of your beloved mother or grandmother who you dearly love, who you're devoted to, and then she bites you? Okay. I mean, it's almost incomprehensible. Physically non-aggressive behaviors, so these aren't going to involve harm per se, but they're certainly inappropriate behaviors, that never-ending pacing that wears 
the hole in the carpet, the inappropriate touching, fondling, if you will. And then shifting from the physical to the verbal, verbally aggressive behaviors, so cursing or screaming. And I don't mean occasionally or randomly. I mean constantly in a never-ending, uh, escalating uh, cacophony. And then verbally non-aggressive behaviors, these are perhaps the mildest on the screen, just repetitive requests or phrases. Mildest, but kind of like water on a stone can wear that caregiver down until they've, they've sort of surrender emotionally. So those are the behaviors we're looking at physically aggressive and non-aggressive, verbally aggressive and non-aggressive. That, well, that's, that's a lot of alliteration there, I think. So where do we find it? So the, the first bullet, I think, is, I hope I'm not going to be taken to task, but Anonymous, one of my favorite persons to quote, Anonymous has stated that nursing homes in, in our country, our first world medicine country, now function as long-term psychiatric hospitals for the elderly. And I think it's, it's never been truer. That's where you'll find this population to the greatest extent. And here we live in a city, San Antonio, 2 million. We've got three or four geriatric psychiatry units, and each of them has 12 or 13 beds. So maybe all told we've got 60 or 70 geri psychiatry beds in, in this very large modern city. And, of course, in nursing homes, agitation, there's that word, agitation is common. It's estimated in the literature maybe 70 to 90 percent of demented nursing home patients at some point in their course, their stay, manifest agitation, and that 50 percent of this is, is actually aggression, you know, towards themselves, towards others, towards staff, towards all of the above. And then bullet three is, you know, you have to read it a couple times, or at least I had to, that the behavioral symptoms of dementia don't always correlate with cognitive decline. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the most seriously, severely demented are the most problematic or aggressive, okay? It's probably true for function, you know, being able to feed, dress, toilet, but not necessarily for behavior. In fact, behavior, we usually see the disturbances, we see peak in the middle to, to severe, middle to late stages, not at the latest. Usually the late stages, folks are becoming more immobilized by the disease, more, uh, the wrong word, but you get the picture catatonic. So um, what about aggression? You know, it's certainly in the news. We just had uh, this horrible event this weekend, a 22-year-old young man in California who's spurned romantically and, and goes on a, a killing spree and announces a manifesto against women and, and, and his roommates. I mean, clearly he's psychotic, delusionally, you know, delusionally persecuted and, and jealous, if you will, and clearly associated with tragic, dreadful aggression. So psychosis can be associated with aggression. It's not a mandate, um, but it can be associated with aggression. Uh, and I think it sort of depends on the, the nature of the psychosis. So delusions, delusions we, we must define. It's a false, firm, fixed belief. A false, firm, fixed belief. And we think that when we look at Alzheimer's patients, um, you know, anywhere from a third to two-thirds, uh, will present with paranoid delusions. The staff is trying to harm me. The maintenance man is trying to steal from me. So, there's, so paranoid delusions appear to be generally the most common. Hallucinations. Now these are, are misperceptions of reality. Uh, they differ from illusions. So the, the difference is if there are trees outside my window and the wind is blowing the trees back and forth, I might say, Look at those figures outside my window. And the person with me would say, no, no, those are that's the, the, the branches blowing in the wind. So it's an actual image that I misperceive. That's an illusion. But if instead there are no trees, it's a blank landscape, and I say to my uh, colleague, look at those intruders marching up the field. There's no stimuli whatsoever. 
and, and I'm misperceiving it. That's a, a hallucination. In other words, a, a, a perceptual disturbance without a stimuli. So what we see in Alzheimer's dementia or demented patients uh, in a global fashion is generally the hallucinations are more visual than auditory. Distinctly different from schizophrenia where the hallucinations are usually more auditory than visual. And in fact, when you get visual hallucinations in a young, young patient, you all, almost always uh, begin an organic workup because of something physical per se. And then last one, but, but trickiest one to be sure is depression is extremely common in dementia, but um, woefully underdiagnosed. And, and why is that? Because patients aren't able to, to describe this to us. They don't have the language or the words, if you will. Um, also, the apathy can be uh, pretty profound, such, such that it's hard to get at. So you have to kind of downshift and, and look at tearfulness, look at loss of appetite, look at loss of pleasure, um, get as much collateral history as you can, because those are going to be the clues, if you will. So where do we find this? So assessment, ideally, uh, probably bullet one should be amended. We want to assess the patient in their surroundings, as opposed to when folks come to my office, whatever you want to call it, reverse white coat syndrome, they're usually on better or best behavior. So if you can assess them in their own place, that would be wonderful and, and, and best practice, but, but difficult. Collateral history, boy, I just hang my hat on this. Family members, the spouse who's known the patient for 50, 60 years, and they're so tuned in to such nuances. The staff, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not talking about the nursing staff, I'm talking about the staff as a whole, um, be it from the, the maintenance person to the cook to the server to transport. had a, a lady today in my office who, whose transporter was able to give me very helpful history. And then, of course, you know, we really want to try and scratch deep specifics. Can you tell me exactly what happened? Can you describe it from beginning to end? A short story. Paint, I usually say, paint me a, a, a verbal picture in two minutes or less. What happened, how it began, what occurred, how it ended, how it resolved. So insist on specifics. And then there's my second reinforcement about it. I always ask, always, it's like a chip in my brain, uh, uh, an obsession. I always ask about sleep, appetite, cheerfulness, and mood. And, and I usually ask the patients these things and then see if I can get validation or, or a, a different story from uh, whomever accompanies them. And lastly, we actually have formal rating scales. We do this in dementia research. These are validated instruments. They, uh, in, they always involve the patient and caregiver. And the, there is an insistence that the caregiver has to spend so many hours a week with the patient to even be allowed to participate. So it's not somebody that just has spot, in and out, sporadic contact. So the NPI is a neuropsychiatric inventory. It's 14 different symptom domains. What you imagine, hallucinations, delusions, depression, things you might not imagine, disinhibition, euphoria, um, aberrant motor activity, and it always asks about sleep and appetite. And this is coded on a scale of mild, moderate, or severe. How much distress does it cause the patient? Mild, moderate, or severe. How much distress does this cause the caregiver? Mild, moderate, severe. And each domain has a number, and the entire inventory has a number. Kind of like for a diabetic, you have a blood sugar, that, that, that kind of determines which way therapy swings based on a number. Hemoglobin A1C, fasting blood sugar. So neuropsychiatric inventory gives us a number in terms of symptom domain and then a global number. Same thing with the Cohen-Mansfield agitation inventory. That's a, a more European measuring stick. So assessment, back to assessment. So we have a, an episode of agitation, and I'm going to make one up in just a minute. 
And this mnemonic, I think, is helpful for the caregiver, extremely helpful for the staff, and what's the word in the commercial? Priceless for the clinician. So it's over. And um, in the left-hand column, you can, you can see what each of those uh, letters stand for. So identify, timing, surroundings, are others involved, how troubling is it, evaluation, response. So let's just, uh, let's just create an event. It's uh, lunchtime on Tuesday, and the lovely Mrs. Flabeets, out of nowhere, throws her bowl of soup at uh, a woman right across the table from her that she's dined with for months and seems to have gotten along well with. Okay, just flings this bowl, bowl of soup, and actually cuts her cheek with it. Okay, so identify what's the problem. Well, we, we've got is this physical aggression, physical non-aggression, verbal aggression, verbal non-aggression. She doesn't say anything; it's just out of the clear blue. Well, I guess we call it physical aggression. Okay, that's the problem. She's never done this before. It's a violent act. Um, when does it happen? Lunchtime. Lunchtime didn't happen at breakfast. Didn't happen last night at dinner. It happened at lunchtime. So you may want to kind of backpedal. What did Mrs. Flabeets do that morning? Was she paced in her activities, or was it we're going to go from one thing to one thing to one thing to the other? Okay. Uh, maybe we can find out from the staff. How did she wake up? Was it on the wrong side of the bed? Did she wake up with pain? What are her vital signs? Like when does it happen? Surroundings. Where does it happen? So it happened at the dining table. It didn't happen in the room. It didn't happen walking in the hall. It happened in the dining table. So can anybody else, the staff say, did, was it provoked by the lady she threw the soup bowl at? Okay. So we're just kind of, we're really trying to understand this as opposed to she threw a bowl of soup. So now let's, let's uh, restrain her. Let's chemically restrain her. Let's isolate her. Let's do something punitive as, as it occurred. Decades ago, back in the days of the snake pit, okay, it was when hospitals were prisons and not, not treatment facilities. Were others involved? Yeah, poor Mrs. Flabeet's table mate, okay, who now is getting a couple of butterfly stitches over her cheek, okay. So who else is involved, right? Now, comes to pass that we now discover through maybe the one of the servers, that for the last week they've had a running argument about something, okay? So maybe there was trouble in River City, okay? How dangerous is it? Pretty dangerous, okay? What else might be a cause, okay? Has there been anything else going on? Has Mrs. Flabeets, please forgive me, been constipated? Has she had a new roommate? Have, have her adult children, which ordinarily visit all the time, haven't been in to see her for a couple of weeks, and she thinks something's wrong. What else might be a cause? So think outside the box. Consider all possibilities. And then how are we going to respond, okay? How are we going to respond? Well, we, we want to respond so that, A, this doesn't happen again. Maybe we're going to seat her at a different table for a bit, okay? Maybe when we reintroduce her back, to the gal that she injured, we're going to have somebody sit with her. I don't know. Okay, how are we going to respond? How do we understand? What, what does Mrs. Flabeets tell us? I left out the most important part here, the patient that this event occurred with. But what I like is, what does this let us do? It organizes an event. Okay? It puts it into perspective so we can understand it, hopefully, so that we can prevent it. Okay, so I love this mnemonic. It's terrific. And by the way, like everything that I've ever said, I plagiarized this from Dr. Kevin Gray. He's a geriatric psychiatrist up at Dallas uh, Parkland Southwest Hospital. Just a, a, a brilliant guy when it comes to, to this whole process. So assessment. Well, I kind of embedded this already. When there's been an episode of agitation, okay, Always consider these four global areas, environment, okay? Has Mrs. Flabeets just come into the facility? Has she had a change in room? She went from a single room to a double room or vice versa, okay? Did something break in a room? Was the heater out? 
the, the, the air conditioning up? Has there been a medical event for Mrs. Fabitz? Has there been a psychiatric event? Her husband died a week ago. And the reason I say this is the, the tendency when this happens is those other three go out the window, and this is all lumped with Mrs. Fabitz has dementia. So expect this to happen. As that, that's always the default piece. Always the default piece in this population. And what we discover is probably the opposite is true. You know, that when people have abrupt and acute changes in mental status, the other three are more likely to account for it as opposed to this is from the dementia progression. Okay? So we're going to begin with non-pharmacologic strategies about how to deal with agitation. And the reason we're going to begin with this is because the FDA, the powerful watchdog of our, of our uh, formulary in, in pharmacotherapy, insists that when a demented patient is agitated, before we get quick on the, on the trigger, uh, for medicines that we must first and foremost think and attempt to utilize non-pharmacologic strategies. And here's where I'll pause and I'll just take my hat off to the angels at uh, nursing homes and assisted living facilities who I think always and everywhere uh, do this almost reflexively. They're always employing non-pharmacologic strategies to head things off at the pass. So it's not as if this is a rarity. I think this is often done, but the FDA would, of course, like to remind us to, to never give up, always employ non-pharmacologic strategies. So again, another mnemonic. Again, I lifted it directly from Kevin Gray, so at least as a plagiarist, I identify it right away. The four S's, okay? And the S's make sense. Number one, maybe, maybe this should be like in real estate, you know, location, location, location. So number one should be safety, safety, safety. The patient, the other residents, the staff, okay? So, you know, I'm describing global things, control risks, you know, driving. This is, this is the one that I encounter in my office all the time. You know, I'm just fine to drive. Um, well, I, I, uh, I'm going to ask you not to. You're a responsible citizen, and um, I'm asking you not to, not just for your own safety, but the safety of others. I know you, you don't want to harm anybody else. I'll, I'll put that emotional argument into play and see if I can, I can uh, make some progress. But uh, safety financially, boy, oh, boy. As a geriatric psychiatrist, I never expected to hear the exploitation that I hear of elderly uh, folks with mild dementia. And it, and it comes from all vectors and all angles. And you might say, what's that got to do with safety? Well, if you're broke, your safety is now in peril. Okay? And then physical safety. And we'll, we'll go into detail about this, but I kind of view this the way we, we view child-proofing our home when our children were little. We want to look at everything as a risk and try and minimize it and, and be one step ahead of, of the, the patient. Serenity. That's a word you don't hear much in, in our culture, okay? But it's a lovely word. So, you know, something that, that, that I think requires an enormous amount of grace and practice, especially when chaos is, uh, is ensuing, you know. Can we manage our affect? Can we control our emotions? You know, um, the, the mammal in us wants to counterpunch. If somebody's angry with me, I'm going to raise my voice in response to them. And my wife likes to remind me that I sometimes thump my chest like a gorilla. I, I don't think so, but what do I know? So we want to manage affects. So simplify. Look at that piece. Communicate affection. And you can just do it with your voice, not just the tone, but what you put into it, the prosody. This is for beats. What's going on here? And a smile, okay? 
And part of that is also distracting, okay? Because she's thrown bowl of soup number one, right next to her is a knife and fork, okay? You don't want that impaled in your forearm. And then structure. Well, I think facilities go to great lengths to organize and structure and simplify, you know, that there's a plan at all points in time. We're going to eat from 12.30 to 12.50, and after that we're going to have a, a nap or a meditation or a music time. And this routine is never varied because with dementia, the whole essence of it is we're unable to learn and anything new creates anxiety and uh, disturbance. And then lastly, don't forget about the caregiver, okay? Sanity. Um, so I saw a young woman this morning. Well, young, yeah, she's a young woman. She's 54. I told her a couple times. You're a very young woman. Her mom is 83 and, and really declining. She's been the, the primary caregiver, and she herself has been sick, had a terrific cancer scare about six weeks ago, got surgery and finally got the news that she has a benign mass, which was a relief, but she's overwhelmed. I think she said overwhelmed three or four times, okay? So our discussion today was about limits and calling in reinforcements and, and, and getting respite, okay? So the four S's. Now, on to more exotic non-pharmacologic strategies. So validation therapy by Naomi Feel, I hope I'm not mispronouncing her name. I'll be honest with you, I didn't know much about this, so I had to cheat. So this is a gal who, who worked with uh, um, developmentally disabled folks, severely autistic folks, and then um, more recently in her career with demented patients. And uh, she's just a huge believer that, that the focus must be on empathy as opposed to logic. So. The best example is Mrs. Flabitz is, is waiting at the door. She's been waiting every day, every week, every month, and periodically half crying, half whimpering. She's waiting for her deceased for 10 years husband to arrive, okay? And, of course, logic tells us to go up to Mrs. Flabitz and say, come with me, let's go back to your room. You know, your husband's been passed now for a long time. That's the logical part of us, okay? It's not the empathic part of us. So, so in, in Field's uh, algorithm, the first thing is for the caregiver to center themselves. Take a big, deep breath, clear your mind, and say, this isn't about logic. This is about respect and validating the other person's feelings, okay? And then approaching the patient, okay? Um, it looks like you're missing him. Tell me about that. Tell me about missing you. And empathizing with them. I know what that's like to miss somebody dearly. Well, and then, you know, tell me some more details. What was, what's his favorite food, you know? What's his favorite color, okay? And, and in the midst of this, you're not marginalizing these folks or dismissing them. On the contrary, you're validating the emotion that's behind this illogical, but, but maybe not so illogical um, posture. Now, if you look at the research on this, it's mixed. In fact, uh, you know, the all-powerful Cochrane Review System, which is a, a British system for looking at data and pronouncing it, whether it's good, bad, or inconclusive, says this is inconclusive. But you know what? What's the harm to trying this? It's not toxic at all. And there are many, many anecdotal reports that this is miraculous, okay? Non-logical, client-centered, it's emotional, it's empathic, okay? We're going to validate their beliefs. You're missing somebody right now. And there's her website. And to more non-pharmacologic strategies. Actually, the, the number one bullet just, just came out a little while ago, uh, a treatment for delirium. So delirium is an organic illness. You know, we see a lot in... Uh, in demented patients who are hospitalized with a fever or an infection, and now they're, they're really disoriented, and they can either be hypoactive or hyperactive. Uh, an interesting study in JAMA that simply bright light therapy, altering, you know, uh, endogenous melatonin can be effective, 
Okay, so bright light therapy alone. Now, of course, this is in the daytime, in the morning, not at night per se. Therapeutic touch and massage. We forget that Elwha Alzheimer's index patient took care of her for four years in a German asylum. Every day, she had a full body massage. Every day, they didn't have medicines in 1902. Every day, got a full body massage. The power of touch. And then, of course, uh, I love the next three. Music hath powers to charm the savage beast. Um, I've had a couple of, uh, of interventions with patients that constantly scream. Everything fails miserably until we put a set of headsets on their ears and, and uh, either discover what their favorite tunes were back in their day or classical music, and it seems to be very helpful. Pet therapy, holy cow. Um, if you go on to units that have pets, you'll discover that they are consummate clinicians with incredible empathy. So simulated presence audio tape therapy, I can only say that once a day. So the adult children live in Vermont. And they love their mom and dad, but they can't pull away. They're raising a family. They're earning a buck. But what can we do in 2014? Well, we can Skype. We can create a videotape, we can create um, a recording, and when they are really feeling poorly, sometimes that voice, that presence, that image, even if they've seen it a dozen times, can be a medicine, a medicine. And then the last one, this is more European. I don't know, I've never seen it here in the United States, but I'm sure folks in our audience have. And, I, and I'm going to massacre this one. It's called Snozzlin room installation and uh, it, it's from uh, European, I want to say the Dutch and the German uh, and I, I can't remember the exact translation, I know part one is doze and I can't remember part two but this is, uh, these are rooms that are, are uh, carefully but artfully lighted They've got all sorts of sensory stimulation, a lot of pillows, comfortable places. They have usually aromatherapy going on. They have music going on, soothing music, okay? Um, so this is uh, part of the distraction redirection. Um, in severely autistic patients, they notice much less aggression. So an interesting fashion. Uh, an interesting medicine and, as you might guess, kind of evolved in the 70s. So that's non-pharmacologic. We'll la add the last one. This isn't a medicine, but it's probably uh, uh, far worse than that. You know, we have all these embedded emotional images from films like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or McMurphy. McMurphy is in a straight jacket while they're going to do ECT or frontal lobotomy. Um, restraints are still used in inpatient settings. Uh, the patient has now pulled out their urinary catheter while inflated. Um, dreadful, but not as dreadful as pulling out his intra-aortic balloon catheter in his, in his heart. Okay or a central line monitoring pressure, okay, or, God forbid, his endotracheal intubation tube. So we certainly don't want those events to happen. They're immediately and emergently life-threatening. So there's a variety of restraints um, ranging from, you know, uh, soft restraints, padded restraints. There's a restraint called a veiled bed. It's kind of netting so that they don't get out of bed and fall or wander. And, you know, I don't think any clinician wants to use them, and we're now regulated that if we use them, we have to indicate why. We have to immediately recheck within an hour whether it's still needed, um, and every 24 hours have to rewrite the order. So it's, it's highly regulated as it should be, and I realize to the casual observer, it's viewed as a quick fix, right? but it, it does have its uh, benefits in reducing 
morbidity and mortality, although there is certainly some boomerang to this. Uh, uh, this you know, prolonged restraint can, can have some dramatic problems in terms of blood clots and blood pressure changes, plus just simply the psychological effect on the patient, the family, and, and the caregiver. And, and they're highly regulated, but they, they still exist. They have their place, although, although hopefully it's extremely limited and only when all else has failed. So here's a, a Yogi Berraism. He's, he's got a wonderful book of about 100 quotations. They're all just as good as this one. I, I, I love it. If you come to a fork in the road, take it. Well, which fork are we talking about, Yogi? It doesn't make any difference. Just take it. So the fork in the road is... We have an agitated patient and all non-pharmacologic attempts singly and multiply and multiple multiples have failed and the situation is now becoming DEFCON 1, code red, okay? So what about medicines? Well, the good news is it's 2014, we have an abundant menu of medicines and with them come caveats. Um, always shoot for the LED, the lowest effective dose. Now, quite often this is guesswork. These are little, frail, vulnerable people on other medicine. We know that as we age, one-third or one-half of the dose that when we're middle-aged works, so we're already in a low dose. And we've never used these medicines before, so this is kind of half guesswork, half clinical, but we're, we're certainly not going with industrial strength dosing. And we'd like to use it for the shortest time necessary. Last night I was reading a review article about uh, um, how long, okay, and, and I'll talk a, a little bit about that in a bit. And then in, impeccable monitoring. Well, I think if we're going to use a medicine that has potential uh, side effects, serious side effects, that, that this goes without saying. And the staff's on top of it. And we're not just going to use this cavalierly because Mrs. Flabeats popped off and maybe yelled a single curse word. That, that would be overkill to the nth, nth degree. And then um, what I'm obsessed with are side effects. I always ask the patient. Um, I, don't, I usually don't cue them up. If, if they say just fine, then I'll cue them up with some clues, and then I'm always going to ask the, the uh, collateral history, the informant for side effects. Because it's a tightrope between too much, we don't want to make folks zombies and, and the uh, catatonic institutionalized of the 1950s, nor do we want to use so little that there's still um, agitation and suffering all around. So um, right out of the box are the cholinesterase inhibitors, the dementia medicines. If they're not already on them, I believe in the first quotation, this is by George Grossberg, he's the uh, geriatric psychiatry wizard at Washington University in St. Louis, and uh, he made this declaration years ago, and I believe it, a neuroleptic is a, is a calming medicine, an anti, a tranquilizer, if you will, and he said that his opinion, you know, Aricept, Exelon, Reminil, and Namenda are downstream neuroleptics. Now, family members would say, you're out of your mind, and, and I would agree with them, they don't work immediately. Okay, but I do think they have a benefit downstream, and we've got evidence that suggests that. Folks that are on these medicines and then taken off them and you follow them in retrospective chart reviews, they, had, they use twice as many psychotropics downstream as people that are on them. Okay, um, Folks that are on these medicines, we can often get by using milder medicines to control agitation. The key is getting these folks on them, it, you know, it's before the horses are out of the barn, so to speak, okay? And where they seem to be most helpful is reducing that irritability and disinhibition. So um, so that's the, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, and I think I made a, an error in that I lumped Namenda memantine into the same category. It's a different mechanism of acting medicine. It doesn't uh, block reuptake of uh, acetylcholine. It, in fact, uh, reduces noise in the neuron itself by modulating glutamate release. 
and, and it's effective all by itself, but what we know is uh, bullet four, the combination of Namenda and Aricept or Namenda and Exelon or Namenda and Reminil appears to be more powerful than either one of them alone. And this is specifically, when we look at the neuropsychiatric inventory, specifically in those three areas, agitation, aggression, irritability, lability, where people lose emotional control and appetite and eating changes. So the antipsychotics, so this could be not an hour's lecture, it could be a day's lecture because uh, this goes into all sorts of layers, but as we alluded to earlier, um, psychotic symptoms are common in this population and can be associated with aggression. Antipsychotics, there are three generations. The first generation, the golden oldies, Melaril and Thorazine from the 60s. The second generation from the 70s, 80s, Haldol, Prolix and Navane, um, Moban. Moban. Um, and then the 11 atypical antipsychotics from the 90s, so three generations. They're all modestly effective where the rubber hits the road is side effects. The first two, Melanol and Thorazine, are absolutely black, black boxed out because of orthostatic hypotension. Elderly, demented patients take these, their blood pressure bottoms out, they fall, break their hip, smash their head open, and we've really done, we've made a bad thing horribly worse, okay? So the second and, and uh, third generation are what's really used. And the one that has the most use historically is Haldol. doesn't mean it's the best. It just means historically that's what's been used the most. And, of course, the Cochrane Review, this British organization that analyzes data, says it's useful, but boy, oh, boy, has it got side effects. All right? And we even put a number on that. We call it NNH, number needed to harm. And it works like this. The lower the number, the lower the NNH, the more likely it is to harm. So if I have a drug and its NNH is 1, that means for every patient that I give this to, a harmful act occurs. So that would be terrible if an NNH was 1. The NNH for treating agitation in demented folks with Haldol is 19. Remember that number. I'm going to come back to it. 19, that's not... That's not bad. Anything that's double digits isn't bad. Anything that's single digits is, is worrisome. So 19, okay? But wait, there's more. So the atypicals, we have 11 of them now. It's a, it's a veritable Chinese restaurant menu. And the reason we have them is we've improved them, or at least we think we've improved them. With the second generation medicine as well, they reduced hallucinations and hallucinations hallucinations and delusions, they cause tremendous motor symptoms. They made people stiff and Parkinson-like. So the newer medicines do not do that, okay? And many of them are in orally disintegrating formulations. You can put them on the tip of their tongue and they dissolve in three seconds. They don't have to swallow them. Maybe they can't swallow. You can put them in coffee, juice, water. The body of, of data is with Zyprexa and Respiradol, and actually, bullet four, Seroquel. So, Respiradol, number needed to harm, 24. Zyprexa, number needed to harm, 28. Seroquel, number needed to harm, 50. 50, okay? And we've got wonderful data with Seroquel and Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's dementia that that may be the drug of choice, okay? Now, there's a medicine called Closeril. This is a an atypical antipsychotic. It's very powerful. It's, it's gotten a lot of schizophrenics out of the back wards of state hospitals and into the community, if you will. The trouble is that it has a 1 in 100 chance of absolutely destroying the patient's white cells, so it has to be monitored. Every two weeks you have to draw a blood count, but uh, that's the medicine of choice for Parkinson's disease with dementia because it causes so little motor stiffness. So newer agents, Abilify and Geodon, we don't have a lot of data on the elderly, and in my opinion, maybe Abilify is, is starting to get some momentum, but 
That's just my opinion. Um, and then, of course, we've got black box warnings from the FDA for all of these medicines and the risk of cardiovascular events. There's a risk here. What about antidepressants? So we talked earlier that depression can be common but difficult to diagnose, so have a low index of suspicion. Um, you know, again, look for signs, not symptoms. So signs are what you can see, symptoms are what you can hear. And uh, the American Academy of Geriatric Psychiatry prefers the class of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There's six medicines in this class. Prozac the first in April Fool's Day, 1987, followed by Zoloft, Paxil, Celexa, Lexapro, and a little known SSRI called Luvox. So the reason they're preferred by the Geriatric Psychiatry Academy is they appear to be the best tolerated. They have little or no effect on blood pressure. They're generally fairly simple, generally fairly safe, okay? And within this class, uh, Celexa and Lexapro, Lexapro is a isomer of Celexa and Zoloft, they have no drug-drug interactions. So this is wonderful in patients, older patients that are on medicines for other illnesses, okay? And then we've got this study done in Scandinavia where Celexa actually outperformed antipsychotics in mildly agitated, demented patients that weren't depressed. It's a single study done over in Scandinavia. And as you probably saw last week, because it got a lot of press, is there was a report that Celexa in animal models of Alzheimer's dementia appeared to have plaque clearing abilities. So go figure, Selexa that we've had since 1996. Maybe it's got some other benefits that we didn't realize, which we love in drugs because we call that repurposing, taking an existing drug and repurposing it. So um, those are the preferred medicines. Now trazodone, also known as Deseril, used a lot more in Europe, and there's some literature on it. This you have to kind of tread carefully because particularly in older people, it's somewhat sedating. You give it at bedtime. If they pop up an hour later to toddle off to the bathroom and they don't pause, this can also drop their blood pressure. So this has to be used with some caution and very low dose. Although, again, uh, you know, DBPC is a double-blind placebo-controlled study where one study indicated that trazodone was effective as Haldol. And, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the symptoms of agitation and the, the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia to explain the acronym. Um, so trazodone, kind of a coin flip. And then, then there's this very obscure drug, but it's been in the United States since the mid-1990s, Remeron. A, a generic name, mirtazapine. It came here as a generic, got no publicity, but it's uh, the medicine of choice for what geriatric psychiatrists call geriatric failure to thrive. So these are older folks that are losing weight, lost their appetite, not sleeping. Their primary care doctors are terrified that they have an occult tumor, so they do a a mega workup, they don't discover any physical cause, and in fact this is a form of depression, and uh, this medicine is renowned for sedation and appetite stimulant effect. So they start sleeping and they start chowing down. So what happens if those fail? Well, you know, we go to plan C now, and we do have a plan C, so these are medicines that began life as anticonvulsants, and uh, now they're going to, uh, you know, psychiatry we love, remember we love to steal from other specialties. So Depakote is a medicine we use all the time in bipolar illness. We also use Tegretol and its gentler version, Trileptal. Neurontin is an anticonvulsant used in chronic pain, but it's a mood stabilizer. So there's anecdotal reports that these help modulate agitation. 
There's some evidence that maybe Depakote and lithium confer neural protection, that maybe these um, minimize these episodes downstream. Uh, drug levels in these medicines, particularly Depakote and lithium, are critical, although usually you don't have to use therapeutic doses. And Plan D, anti-anxiety agents, benzodiazepines. Well, even though they are stigmatized and they're villainous, uh, they are widely and commonly prescribed by all sorts of uh, specialists especially as a PRN, meaning as needed for agitation. So what are these medicines? Xanax, Ativan, Clonopin, Valium. Um, they differ in terms of their duration of effect. There is the long-acting Valium, Transine, Clonopin. Ativan is inter by long-acting 12 to 24 hours. Ativan, intermediate-acting, 6 to 8 hours. Xanax, uh, short acting two to four hours okay the, the trouble is while these medicines work and they work almost within minutes to calm patients for lack of a better verb all sorts of concerns exist they make these folks great fall risks in a subpopulation of the elderly and demented instead of calming them they cause paradoxical excitement yeah um, they don't make anybody, including you and I, think faster, better, sharper. They dull us. They're amnestic medicines. Um, if you go in to get a procedure done, a colonoscopy, they're going to give you a medicine like Versed, which is a short-acting angiolytic, because you'll go night-night for the procedure, and you won't remember what happened during it. Okay? So... There's a study that says Xanax is as effective as Haldol in managing disruptive episodes. It's kind of like pick your poisons, but when all else fails, this is another modality. Buspar, this is the only non-addicting anti-anxiety medicine, um, and that's a wonderful thing, but, uh, you know, it, it doesn't work right away. That's the drawback. Now, what about for special cases, the hypersexual, demented patient, be it um, man or woman? Well, if it's a, a man, we generally will, will use hormonal replacement therapy or Paxil, okay? For women, we usually use Paxil. Um, what if they are incredibly apathetic and sleepy? There have been case reports of ProVigil. This is a wakefulness agent for sleep disorders, narcolepsy, um, obstructive sleep apnea with residual sleepiness, even with CPAP, and shift workers. So there have been case reports that this makes uh, these patients are incredibly apathetic, a little more energized and mobilized. And then the last one, Indrol, it's a blood pressure medicine. There's a literature in using high-dose beta blockers like Indrol, first in populations that are quite disabled, like uh, uh, developmentally disabled that are aggressive, and it seems to be helpful. But again, this is going to be last resort because you're now altering their blood pressure. So in the minute remaining, the American Academy uh, of Geriatric Psychiatry, they've issued a position paper on care and management of the patients. And it's kind of interesting. Remember our four S's before? So there's a little bit of a duplication here. So safety, you know, we always want to think about the patient's safety in all dimensions, if they're ambulatory, about falls, if they're ambulatory, about wandering outside in other patients' rooms in the wrong places at the wrong time. Of course, driving, accidents, so childproof the house, uh, you know, put that wonderful safe return bracelet on. On the other wrist, put on the first alert. alert. Structure, we talked about this, but to include scheduled voiding. Sometimes it takes an enormous burden off the caregiver. What if it turned out Mrs. Flabeets threw the soup because she had a dreadful accident and didn't know what else to do, and she was ashamed? Okay. Medical management for agitation, always look closely medically. They have a fever. 
A urinary tract infection is so darn common. A pneumonia, a fecal impaction, new onset of pain, okay? Dehydration. Boy, I see that all the time here in the Sun Belt. And then uh, advanced directives, well, I think this is the AAGP really looking downstream. Never too early. And in the interest of time, do we dare show their position paper on caregivers? It has six points instead of four. And I like the first and the last. Educate, educate, educate. Because if, if we're knowledgeable about something, we'll be less fearful. I didn't say not fearful, but less fearful. Okay. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. Okay. And respite, respite, respite. You know, I think of the, the magnificent caregivers that are, are doing this solo. And I always say to them, you know, this is 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, if your spouse was in a facility, there'd be three shifts doing what you're doing. You have to take care of yourself. You have to call in the cavalry. You have to get reinforcements. Because if you break down, the whole thing breaks down. So, um, and the rest is self-evident. And on that note, I will cease and desist. Thank you for your attention.